All right. Well, we'd like to welcome you to our virtual pumpkin field day. Thank you all for attending. We appreciate your especially flexibility as we deliver this program virtually this year, and we appreciate everyone in the audience. So uh, to start off with, uh, we uh, give a little bit of overview. We're going to give some brief presentations from various uh, specialists and, uh, and uh, people we have here to uh, give some research updates. We'll give a brief walkthrough of some of the varieties and things we have, and then also try to field a few questions as well. So uh, with all of this, we will be doing more in-depth information uh, through recorded videos on details of the trial and things since we do not have time to visit, go through all the varieties listed and everything we could possibly do. So that is uh, a little bit of a synopsis of how we're gonna handle things. And we certainly appreciate you uh, being here today. To start off with, we are going to uh, lead in to talk a little bit about um, insect management in our uh, in our pumpkin crops. We are uh, happy to have Dr. Casey Athey here, and she is a new entomologist, freshly uh, freshly on board with us. And so uh, we really appreciate her. And I will hand things over to her. Hi. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I am new here as a specialty crops entomologist at U of I, and I just started on Friday. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you just a little bit of background to me and the research that I have done previously and where um, I've worked before, and then I'll talk a little bit about the pumpkin insect pests. Now, of course, I won't be mentioning anything about what happened this year because I'm new, so I haven't actually uh, done any field research here in Illinois yet, but next year I will have more of an update for you. Um, so to start with, if you want to, can you hold that up there? Thank you. Okay. So this poster is just sort of, this is an overview of two of the projects I've been involved with. So my background, I'm from Nebraska and I did all of my graduate work in Kentucky at the University of Kentucky. And then I went to Washington State um, to do a postdoc and that's where I've been for the last year. So in Kentucky, I did a variety of projects, but for um, the growers here, the most interesting one is probably the insect control in organic cucurbits. So one of the things that my research focuses on is alternatives to pesticide use um, and uh, other methods of control. And so when I was in Kentucky, we worked on, on projects with cultural control. And so the main project that I worked with was row covers in squash and melon. And so traditionally we've used sort of these fabric row covers that aren't very breathable. You can't scout through them. You can't spray through them. And if you have to go underneath them, they get really hot and really uncomfortable. You also have to take them off for half of the growing season because it gets too hot and you have to allow bees to come in there for pollination. So we were looking at an alternative, which would, which was more breathable. You could put it on after pollination. Um, it was much cooler. And we were looking at that for um, insect exclusion and mainly for cucumber beetles because in Kentucky for us, bacterial wilt is a very big problem. And so what we found is that utilizing these newer row covers uh, reduced insects in the plots, um, basically across the board, all pests we were looking at. And it also increased yield um, uh, pretty regularly. So the other thing that I did in those crops was I looked at the generalist predators. And so that's one thing that I will probably continue to do now that I'm in Illinois, is always look at um, the insects and spiders that are in the plots and what they're eating, especially the pests um, in the system. So in cucurbits, if you have aphids, you often don't want to be spraying those aphids um, because often sprays will actually exacerbate an aphid problem. And so we like to look at these other predators and see if we can take some more natural um, control measures. So that was that project. Um, and then for my postdoc in Washington State, I was working on a really interesting project, although not as relevant to cucurbit growers, but uh, it was an apple crop. So codling moth is the biggest pest of apples worldwide. And so we did this project, it's called sterile insect release. So you take a codling moth, you sterilize it, you release it back into the environment and it mates with the moths that are there and then they don't lay eggs and your population goes down. So it's another non-insecticidal control. Um, and we see pretty good results of that. We're in year three of that trial now. Pumpkin insect pests. Um, so here in Illinois, especially, 
probably the most important one up here is the squash bug. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second, a little bit extra. So we also have the spotted and striped cucumber beetles, which transmit bacterial wilt, which is really more of a problem in other cucurbits, not so much in, in pumpkins, although um, uh, they're, they're definitely an issue in that as well. And then the squash vine borer, which I think is really important to see a picture of, because I have talked to people before that don't know what it looks like. It's a very beautiful moth. And I have uh, talked to people who see it and think they need to sort of conserve it and think it's really nice to have around. And of course, then all of the squash dies. So this is the squash vine borer and it's a clear wing moth. And that's another one of our uh, main pumpkin pests in the state. But back to squash bug. So um, it's important for squash bug that you scout early and that you try to get the problem when it's early in the season. Because a lot of the insecticides we have available are not really effective on the adult squash bugs. They're really more effective on the, on the nymphs there. Um, and in Southern Illinois, you have two generations um, usually per year. So you're gonna need to do that you know, twice, but it's most important early in the season. Uh, the other thing related to research that I did um, during my graduate work is that these little nymphs tend to get taken down by spiders and other general predators. And so your conservation biological control is also most important early in the year when they're, when they're little, um, especially uh, big black widow spiders that are often in the uh, crops, they will take down quite a few of these squash bugs. Um, and that's about all for me. Um, I'm happy to be here and uh, looking forward to meeting everybody. Thank you very much. So next we are going to go in to talk a little bit about disease management. Uh, our plant pathologist, uh, Mah Dr. Mohamed Babadoust, has uh, actually recorded a short, uh, short video, especially talking about powdery mildew. Uh, and so, uh, so we're going to uh, record or play that. I also am gonna highlight a few uh, things that he wanted to share with you. The first being uh, issues with bacterial spot. So uh, uh, Dr. Babadus had left some samples, and here you can probably see, I believe, some uh, some of the bacterial spot infection. If we get this in, you can see some of the. Uh, I know it shows up a little bit bright in the sun. There's these small specks here on the individual fruit, and here you see a, a larger lesion. The biggest notes and take homes on this is that, uh, and we'll we will share his spray program. And those of you that uh, anyone that's registered, we will. Uh, we will hold, um, we will share all of these, uh, all the information, follow up with the email with links to all of our guides and information we refer to uh, via email. So uh, with all these, if you use the spray program as you recommended, the biggest thing is keeping the fruit dry. Even with this, a lesion like you see here, that lesion can still uh, not lead to any fruit rot or issues if it stays dry. If it we would have a wet season like we've had now, uh, and it would, that fruit would stay out in the moisture, you're gonna get secondary pathogens that would come in and can cause issues because you have that open wound in the fruit. So that is one of the, probably one of the biggest take homes on that disease. Uh, we will later be sharing information uh, as a follow-up uh, that he has provided with us on downy mildew, more details on bacterial spot, and uh, also phytophthora blight, and then, the, then we will share right now, we're going and share his message about you, about powdery mildew, which is by and large the, uh, the most common widespread uh, disease that growers have to deal with. So the biggest thing with powdery mildew is, and this is a leaf, a highly infected leaf that you can see here, if you notice, all of the white, almost powdered sugar looking uh, substance on the leaf surface, that is powdery mildew. Now note, you also see other similar issues, uh, some of which are naturally occurring. You'll see uh, areas of the leaf as they expand on many varieties that will have a whitish look. Oftentimes at first glance, this can be mistaken for that. Note that the powdery mildew, if you actually see that, is truly raised up on top of the leaf. It's almost something that you can, you can kind of rub off a little bit. If it's not something you can rub off, that's probably something else. Uh, but powdery mildew is very common. Some of the most common uh, spray program uh, that we have 
Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of organic options for this. So it's all basically a, a spray based program. Uh, through the research of Dr. Bar Bavadus and his lab, we have the use of a fungicide called Quintec. And along that, along with a form of copper, when you can apply that and then rotate that with uh, another product called Procure along with uh, copper, that is some of the, his primary recommendation as far as making weekly applications through um, of those two products, rotated one one week and one the following week uh, along, the, along those lines. And especially hitting through now and, and really with probably some of our, our final sprays ending up here in the next week to probably a week to 10 days. Uh, whenever I asked uh, Dr. Babadus earlier, he said that really, if your vines are healthy and as far as powdery mildew goes, if you had the vines healthy as of early September, that could be kind of the early to mid September could be the kind of the end of your spray program. Things like downy mildew, which has been confirmed in Illinois and especially in southeastern Illinois, is also another thing that we need to be worried about a little later on. And so you would still need to maintain through a spray program through harvest for that. But powdery mildew, if we can maintain a good crop canopy through now, we can continue that through and we will have, um, and we do not need to continue a spray program through the later parts of September and into October. So with that, um, the next up we're gonna have is uh, we're gonna have Lindsay Orphan, who is uh, a graduate student at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. She is doing work in weed management. Good afternoon, guys. I'm Lindsay Orphan. Um, like Nathan said, I'm a second year master's student at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Um, I'm studying uh, weed management in pumpkins specifically. And so two different studies that I have here at the Belleville Research Center is looking at two different aspects of weed management. So one is um, different weed and herbicide regimens that you can use in pumpkins. And then also, um, looking at how long we need to keep the pumpkins free of weeds until yield is impacted or until yield is no longer impacted. Um, and so my first study, the economic analysis is looking at um, seven different herbicide regimens. The primary uh, herbicides that we're looking at are they're pre-emergent herbicides because there's not very many post-emergent or herbicide options in general to be used in pumpkins. Um, the three, four main herbicides that we're looking at are Prefix, dual magnum uh, strategy, and then we look in at we look at Sandia to be used as a pre-emergent and as a post option when your uh, your weeds are four to six inches tall. If you come over the top of your pumpkins, when your weeds are at target height, you can apply the Sandia, and it will you'll get good control over your four to six inch uh, size broadleaves, but you'll have very little crop injury on your pumpkins. The second study that we have is a critical weed free period. And so what we do is we keep the pumpkins free of weeds for so many uh, days post um, seeding. And so I have uh, six different um, timings on weed removal. And so I have plots that are kept free of weeds from the day that they are planted until the day they are harvested. And I have plots that are kept full of weeds from the day that they are planted till the day they are harvested and everything in between. And so this is the second year on both of these trials. And last year, the critical weed free period trial, um, actually the yield proved that there was not a significant difference in the weedy all season versus the weed free all season. But of course, for all producers, you want to control the weeds in your fields for a multitude of reasons. Aesthetics, you don't want a dirty looking field. Um, you want the ease of yield. You don't want to be having to uh, navigate in and out of these tall weeds. And I, overall, you're always going to have pumpkins competing with weeds that you don't want. There will always be some aspect of um, impact to the yield. Um, and then I guess it goes, that's all I have. I already talked about it. Yeah. So I'm going to hand it back to Nathan. 
Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, I do want to add a few comments regarding uh, weed management in pumpkins. Um, the probably the, the biggest thing in doing a lot of the previous research where uh, where I have been involved is in different herbicide trials where water hemp especially is your primary goal when you're trying to manage. Some things to consider would be looking for uh, uh, trying to, most of the cases we're looking at a herbicide program. Uh, if you're trying to raise without herbicides, the, the best thing I have, you know, certainly cultivation and timely cultivations can work. Uh, a good uh, no-till system, especially where you'd have, say, a stale seed bed, a seed bed that has been prepared and you have had a flushes of weeds come up, that's another option if you can plan into that. Uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, cover crops, and so even a, a dense, thick cover crop system, uh, when we take a look at some of our, uh, our trials here, we, uh, we will um, we'll see a s system where we're actually no-tilling after wheat in wheat stubble. So we have a lot of opportunities there to, uh, to help manage the weeds through other cultural practices. If when it comes to herbicides, I'm not going to hit on everything. We have in Illinois, we have a special use label which you can uh, we, you can download uh, for dual magnum and also reflex. And when you use those two products together, this is a pre-emergent, so it's sprayed either prior to uh, transplanting or right after you direct seed before anything has emerged. In that case, those are are some very good soil residual products for uh, water hemp control, which is one of our predominant weeds. Uh, strategy is another product it is good on other larger seeded broadleaves. Um, and so that is, that is another option that we have uh, when it comes to some of the chemical options. The, the last primary one would be, uh, would be san, uh, Sandia. Sandia can be used early as a post-emergence application or it can be also used as a pre-emergence uh, it has a, a lot of utility, uh, but it's, it's for that option that it can be used pre or post. However, its limitation comes in that it doesn't have a very wide weed spectrum. Certainly cockleburr is one of its strong points. Nutsedge is one of its strong points. And from there, uh, there's not as many things that's effective on. So, uh, so that unfortunately doesn't give us a lot of control of pig weeds and other things like water hemp that are very problematic. So that's just a quick, some quick highlights of some, some weed management challenges uh, and how, how I would maybe approach some of those. So next we are going to switch over to uh, Dr. Alan Walters from Southern Illinois University. And he's gonna talk some about general uh, uh, pumpkin management and then also, some, also about pollinators. Thank you, Nathan. It's great to be here on such a beautiful day. Uh, and uh, to see some sunshine for a change. Uh, but as Nathan uh, pointed out, I'm Dr. Walters from Southern Illinois University, and uh, we've done research in my uh, program here since about uh, 2000. I started at SIU in 1998, so you can see we've been here many years doing a lot of uh, pumpkin research at our Belleville Research Station. And uh, a lot over the years have been on uh, no-till research, trying to develop systems for no-till pumpkins in, in the state, as well as uh, some weed research uh, on pumpkins, as well as a little bit on, um, on pollinator uh, activity and the effects on, on pumpkin yield. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the uh, issues that we have with uh, pollinators and pumpkins and why do we need uh, insect pollinators and pumpkins. If we kind of uh, take a look around right behind me, you can see uh, what type of landscape that we are in. We are in a agronomic landscape in which there's not a lot of uh, flowers for uh, bees uh, to kind of either get nectar or to uh, uh, get pollen uh, for food. So uh, in that type of landscape, uh, what is actually pollinating our, uh, our pumpkins? Uh, being in that type of uh, a landscape, which we have limited amounts of, of pollinators that we, uh, 
we see. So we uh, did a study here uh, in the early 2000s looking at uh, providing honeybee colonies uh, into uh, certain fields and then not having honeybee colonies in other fields. And what we found there was that there's really no difference in pumpkin set because there are na uh, native pollinators here, but we do get an increase in fruit size if we put honeybees out because they repeatedly visit the flowers and we're able to uh, get higher amounts of a pollen load on uh, the female flower. So pumpkins are what we call monitious and in that they uh, have both male and female flowers. That's why we need insect pollinators on pumpkins uh, due to the morphology of the, uh, the pumpkin plant. So a male flower uh, would be one uh, that you see here. This is an old flower that uh, it's 1230 or so now and they usually start to close about uh, noon. So if you open this uh, flower up, it's been today, uh, you'll look inside and you'll see the, uh, the anther with the pollen on it. And it kind of, you can just kind of, there's still a little bit of pollen there and you can kind of see it there on, on my, my finger. Uh, that pollen is then used to pollinate a female flower. And I ripped this a flower apart earlier so you can act the, uh, the female parts of the flower. So when you look into a cucurbit field, whether it's pumpkins, watermelons, cucumbers, whatever, uh, the female flower is always going to kind of look like that cucurbit that you're going to eventually harvest the fruit from. And that female flower has to have that pollen from the male flower to reach the stigmatic surface here on top. That pollen then germinates, grows down through the style, down to an ovule where we get seed production, which causes the fruit to actually form and swell. The more pollen load we have, the, uh, the greater the fruit size typically is going to, uh, to be. So uh, due to the issue with uh, pollinators, I uh, uh, designed a study with the farm manager uh, here uh, for this past year. And uh, this year we kind of started implementing it in which we're trying to bring more pollinators into a pumpkin uh, field by using clover strips uh, to see if that will bring in uh, more pollinators on those pumpkin flowers. Uh, plus that clover is beneficial because if you have customers walking through your pumpkin field and it's kind of wet, they can walk to the clover strips uh, and not go through all the mud uh, and get them on their shoes or whatever as they're walking through through the field. Uh, so my grad student, Lindsay, who you just uh, kind of met, uh, she and Dane, who is the farm manager, kind of uh, did some initial uh, pollinator uh, counts earlier in the, in the growing season to see how many uh, bees were actually visiting those flowers on pumpkins between like 8 and 10 a.m. So we have two different areas. We have one area where we added the wheat and uh, where we have the, the no-till situation and uh, another area in which we have the, uh, the clover. Uh, so we have a bare soil area and we have a clover area, okay? So those two areas, then we're comparing the yield that we're going to get the pumpkin fruit set that we're going to get as well as uh, what the potential difference that we're going to see in adding clover into that system is it beneficial is it not beneficial we're we wasting our time uh, with that so that's uh, an important part of this so i wanted to kind of explain a couple things is to kind of first uh, give you a little bit of background on pumpkins pollination how it's important and then how we live in an environment that's kind of devoid of pollinators uh, in this agronomic environment uh, without having a lot of flowers around, uh, how can we pull pollinators in to pollinate the, uh, the pumpkins that we have? And one of the pollinators that is very important uh, is a, uh, a squash bean. He's still in the flower. He tried to get out on me. 
but he's still he's still hanging in here. And uh, the main pollinators, I got he's got to hold him in there a little bit longer. Okay, the main pollinators we get here are bumblebees, honeybees, and squash bees. So right now I walked out there, and it's mostly bumblebees and squash bees. We had a few uh, honeybees earlier in the day. Honeybees and squash bees, which are native bee to the United States, look a lot alike. A lot of you will get them kind of confused. The, uh, the squash bee looks more like a kind of like a hornet, a little more striped, a little more pointed tail on it. And uh, I'm going to try to get this guy out of here and show him to you. He's hiding on me. There he is. He's down on the bottom. I don't want to bite me, but I'm trying to keep him staying in the, in the bottom to his head. So, can you see that? Oh, he just kind of flew away on me. But that's all right. Uh, squash bees and uh, honeybees kind of looks similar in a lot of ways. But uh, honeybees and... Uh, and squash bees are both uh, primarily nectar connector, uh, uh, collectors. And while we have the uh, bumblebee that's primarily collecting pollen. And so I was hoping to show you that. I went out to the field and kind of collected it, but didn't uh, do a good job and you kind of got away from me. But I hope you gain a little bit understanding about pollinators. And we're going to kind of uh, move on uh, to, uh, to uh, Dr. Wally here. And uh, thanks for your time, and I hope you gain something out of this virtual field day. Alan, you want to stay here because we've got a question that came uh, from those listening. Uh, why does a greater pollen load on the stigma lead to larger fruit size? Because you have uh, more uh, pollen grains that are going to germinate, and each one of those pollen grains goes down to fertilize an ovule, which then becomes a seed. So you actually get more seed production in the fruit. So you get more seed production in the fruit. The fruit size tends to uh, to increase, and it all relates to the amount of pollen and the uh, and the load that you have on there and the number of seed that's going to be uh, produced. For example, if you only have a couple of pollen grains land on a uh, a stigmatic surface, you're only going to be able to get two seeds developed. You're going to have a small fruit. You know, when you cut a pumpkin fruit open, you have hundreds of seeds in there, which uh, that relates to hundreds of pollen grains that made it all the way down into the ovary to fertilize those ovules. Nathan? All right, so uh, that's just a, a little uh, synopsis of, of some of that information. Uh, before we break away a little bit more to talk about the variety trial, we do have a few submitted questions, and I will ask uh, Dr. Athey even to come up, and just so we're going to take a, a few of those now and, uh, and answer some of those. Uh, let's see, Sarah, what, uh, what, do you have, what do you have first for us? So the effect of constant fungicide sprays. So um, this is obviously something that there's lots of ongoing research on. Uh, there, there certainly has been even preliminary data that suggests that there could be some insect interactions with some of our fungicides. And of course, uh, not all uh, fungi or bacteria in the environment are, are detri plant detrimental or, or pathogenic. They are also beneficial. So that is an ongoing, uh, an ongoing area of research. We do not have all the answers for it. Uh, however, you know, we do know that, uh, especially in the environment in Southern Illinois where we're at, that uh, some of these diseases uh, just don't allow us to uh, raise pumpkins and we don't have the ability to raise a good pumpkin without that, given what we know now. Hopefully with the evolution of more biopesticides and other things, we can continue to find more options to uh, help manage disease, allow us to grow a healthy crop and, uh, and reduce some of those reliances that we have on that. How do you keep pumpkins from rotting in the field? I think probably uh, one of the best things is having 
uh, having so far, and this kind of is, uh, goes along with what we just said in a way, is unfortunately having a good spray program uh, and maintaining health of those plants. Now, if you, uh, certainly I think that's not just fungicide, but it, it's all inclusive. It's having the nutrients they need, making sure there's no weed competition. Uh, certainly diseases and insects are very important. And, uh, and so that's, uh, if you have my rule of thumb and, and Dr. Walters, I'll let you chime in, is that if you can harvest a plant from a, uh, harvest a pumpkin from a healthy vine, that's going to be a, a good pumpkin that's not going to rot in the field. It's going to, uh, is, is going to really be a very, it's gonna be a healthy fruit that's gonna last for, for many months. Now, if you have a vine that is half dead and you go to you know, harvest that fruit, the shelf life is not there and, and it's just not going to have that same, uh, same shelf life. Dr. Walters, what are your comments on that? Spray programs are very important, but as Nathan knows, he came out of my research program and we do a lot of no-till pumpkin production. Getting that fruit up off of the soil is also key to keeping it from rotting. Uh, when you have lots of rainfall, uh, it dries much faster than, uh, than being uh, laying on top of a soil somewhere. But maintaining that fungicide and bacteria side spray program I don't think we've talked much about bactericides, but uh, copper is very important to maintain that, that uh, fruit uh, free of bacterial spot. And so once it gets about baseball size, you're supposed to start spraying that, that fruit uh, on the plant to prevent that from, from occurring. So uh, the spray program is important. But if there's any way you can kind of get that fruit up off of the ground, that would be very beneficial as well. Nathan? Those were only utilized as pass in the field no, because the competition with pumpkin plants would be way too much. So we use those as like a drive row in the field. That's what we're hoping to use them as, like a drive row uh, or walking path through the field. If you did like a living mulch, and we've tried living mulches, it's just uh, too, too much competition for the pumpkins and it just doesn't work. You, you limit your productivity of the pumpkins and the size of the pumpkins when you uh, use those inter, kind of interplanted with the, uh, the pumpkins. Nathan? All right, I think we also had a few other entomology related questions. Uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Athey uh, talk about a, a few of those. The first one was, uh, the first one was involving uh, how to manage spraying uh, while we have a blooming crop. Yeah, so, you know, as, as most people know, a lot of the sprays will affect bees quite a bit. And so we want to be really careful with our, with our blooming crop because we don't want to spray anything directly on bees. Um, there are quite a few bee safe um, insecticides uh, that are better to spray. Obviously you would want to avoid, avoid anything that's a neonicotinoid on any flower ever. But if you're going to spray, you want to spray later in the evening. Um, and uh, you know, especially once the flowers sort of closed up for the night. Those are always, that's always a better time to spray your insecticides um, to try to try to protect your bees, for sure. So one other comment was made about, are there any biopesticides that can be used, especially on for squash bug management? So, I don't know of any biopesticides specifically. One of the problems with squash bugs is, of course, a lot of the insecticides we have aren't super effective on squash bugs. Um, and so right now, most of the chemicals are still like the pyrethroid, pyrethrin world as far as um, what's going to be effective on your squash bugs. And as I said before, you really want to get at those when you've got nymphs or eggs. Um, it's the best, when the nymphs have hatched, is the best time to really be controlling your squash bugs and knocking down that population early. 
All right. Uh, and certainly if you have any questions as we kind of start to wind down at least a, a part of the, uh, the virtual broadcast, feel free to uh, enter them in the chat box and we will try our best to, uh, to handle some of those. So to, uh, to uh, wrap up, um, uh, as we kind of talk about also the, uh, the, the variety trial we have here, um, we're gonna pan over and give you a little perspective or talk briefly about the production uh, and maybe, uh, maybe we'll look at a few varieties here. Uh, due to time, we're not gonna hit everything, um, but I wanna showcase a little bit, uh, a little bit of what we have. So this was planted uh, on, transplanted on June 29th. This was in, as you can probably tell from the picture, this was in uh, wheat, wheat was harvested. We then, after harvest, we, we made a spray application for weed management and then no-till transplanted into the wheat stubble. So uh, this crop has been in the ground just a few days over two months. We have uh, our early maturing and our early fruit set starting to come on. And so uh, we're, we've had very good luck with that. I didn't mention before, we have been overwhelmed with rain this season at, at the Belleville Research Center, just east of St. Louis, where we're located. We have between June 1st or really shortly after we planted all the way through August 15th, we've had 19 inches of rain or actually a little bit more than that, which is roughly about half of our annual precipitation within 45 days. So that has been very challenging. In some areas, we've actually drowned out and lost some of our fruit uh, and, and plants in those areas. However, this, is, this area has good drainage and we've been able to uh, manage a, uh, a good crop. So, uh, with that, we're going to take a quick walk through and, and just look at a few of the varieties. So we're gonna start off with a few of the uh, larger fruit. We're going to have, uh, this is one that is called Hulk. Uh, and so this is a, a larger fruited variety, uh, nice tall shape, uh, and then uh, and uh, has a, a taller jack-o'-lantern appearance compared with some, uh, some of the others. The next one here, we have, we have Big Doris. Uh, this is uh, kind of a sample of what some of the fruit look like. This is, a, I would say, a very small version. Here you can see uh, a larger green fruit, which is coming on. And Big Doris is, is one of the uh, characteristics. It is a very large uh, diameter handle, uh, very good to, very sturdily attached. And that's uh, some really good uh, characteristics there. Those are a few highlights of larger ones. Moving on to more medium-sized pumpkins. Zeus is a, is a, a fairly standard uh, variety that's been around for a few years. Uh, you can see this one is just coloring up. Nice, uh, nice length handle, uh, not too long, not too short. And uh, 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 you know, one, of the, probably the, one of the standards for the region. Next, we also have Spartan. Uh, this is one, again, little, not quite, doesn't quite have its full color, a little bit larger in size, uh, probably around that 20 pound range or so. Again, nice stem and handle uh, and, and good coloration. A few more, uh, we also have uh, Spartacus, which is a newer variety. Again, this uh, very nice, uh, large, large handle on it, very well attached, uh, nice otherwise shape and ribbing. Uh, Skidoo Gold, which is actually a little bit of smaller fruited variety, which can be a nice niche where you want uh, 
uh, especially if you're packing larger quantities, want a, a higher bin count pumpkin or just a, a small size jack-o'-lantern. Uh, very good, uh, good variety here. We also have a few uh, new releases. This is one of the ones that hopefully in a few years will be coming out from the breeding program from Southern Illinois University. This is one they call SIU 15. Uh, very, uh, very nice shape and our goal, their goals in that research I know was especially trying to breed a pumpkin that is adapted to Southern Illinois. Uh, we have a little more heat and humidity than some of the areas. So that is, uh, that is certainly something that we are, uh, we are trying to, uh, to manage. I see we have another, another question coming in here. We'll try to All right, row spacing and seed spacing on the hybrid trial. So on the on the trial, um, we will uh, I will share with you guys a, a final report. Uh, just to uh, roughly speaking, though, our uh, the larger ones which we first saw were at 32 square feet per plant. As we moved on to these medium-sized jack-o'-lanterns and all the specialty pumpkins, you'll see are all at 24 square feet uh, per variety. These were um, in this case, these were either six or eight feet, eight foot rows, and then the plants were set four feet apart. So that was our spacing on this. Um, in this case, uh, you asked about the variety Talon. Uh, Talon was actually not included this year. Uh, we've had it in the past. However, Talon was actually a variety that I was told by seed companies actually being discontinued, unfortunately. Um, and certainly if, uh, if anyone from the seed world knows otherwise from that, uh, feel free to chime in, but from the uh, the uh, rep from the breeding company on that line I'd asked and that one was not included because that was uh, not going to be uh, probably available again in the future. So that is why that is not not provided. All right, so for uh, we went ahead, um, for the sake of time, we skipped to some of the specialty pumpkins to give something a little bit different here. And there are more jack-o'-lanterns, but even we only have about uh, 10 minutes or less left, I wanted to run through some of these. Autumn buckskin is, uh, is a tan variety. Uh, it hasn't, this one hasn't quite reached its mature color yet, but that is a, uh, a, a tan variety that is very, uh, uh, is, a, is a nice, uh, Mushada type, so it's more of a processing type versus the uh, the traditional uh, Peepo type pumpkin, which would be a jack-o'-lantern type variety. Uh, very good yielding in previous trials and uh, has a nice, nice tan appearance for that specialty pumpkin look. Blue Doll, uh, this is a, uh, is in the Blue Jaredale kind of family. The difference in this is they're a little bit more upright in their appearance. They, uh, they stand upright. They have a little more kind of blocky appearance versus a Jaredale that's, that's more rounded and flattened in nature. Uh, really nice. The only comment in, in previous experiences with Blue Doll, I've seen it uh, from various times. It will actually naturally split right down the middle of the stem and it'll actually open up to the inside of the stem. So that way you, and in some cases then water gets inside and they don't keep. However, that's, uh, it still produces a lot of really nice, unique fruit that are, are very good. Uh, Colorado Sunrise, uh, this fruit has, um, uh, this is a new variety. In this case, we have a, a kind of a, a, a blue and kind of a, a pale uh, overtone to that. Uh, I'll be really interested to see how this one performs. This is a, with the round stem as a Maxima type. I think a, a very nice, um, uh, nice addition to uh, to some of the uh, specialty options we have. Fairy tail is kind of the standard deep ribbed, um, uh, excuse me, a a mushata type. Uh, it will eventually. This one is still green, but it will turn a tan color, similar to the autumn buckskin. 
Uh, great variety for that added color. Flat white bore. Um, this one has some scarring on it. There's one sample we pulled out for now, but that uh, one of the nice uh, flat stacking style pumpkins. We'll look at some others here along that uh, other variations of that. Mellow yellow. This one, uh, we don't quite have the full yellow, but in these, when they do get their full color, are a bright yellow. Uh, similar if you've grown the pie pumpkin uh, sunlight. This would be like kind of like a larger version of that. Very bright uh, yellow in color. This one is still needs a little time to fully develop that coloration. Jewel box is a, is a Machada type. You see this one getting its color in. It only differences. It has some uh, kind of bumps and that warty appearance to the surface compared with the smoother finishes of the autumn buckskin and fairy tail. Moonstein is, is, a, is a nice small peepo type uh, white that that's uh, uh, is a, has kind of become a standard on that small sized uh, in that white color. It holds its white fairly well. Moonstacker is a is a is comparable with flat white uh, the flat white boar and a, another uh, improved variety on that. I'll be very interested to see yield wise how that uh, compares as far as its uh, quality and ability compared with a flat white boar. Peanut pumpkin uh, is is uh, also in a maxima type. Uh, noted by the uh, the surface that has made the uh, cracks and calluses on it that as they mature look a lot like peanut shells. This one is probably moderate. I've seen some get a, have ex this look extremely a lot like peanuts. Uh, very good, uh, very consistent appearance on them. That uh, like this one that does vary. They're not all uh, exactly the same as far as their the amount of peanut shell look they have to them. RPX 6889 is a newer warded variety um, that is not yet released, but hopefully will be coming out soon. This one hasn't quite gotten its full color. However, it, um, it does have, uh, it will end up having an orange background with those dark green warts. So we have RPX 6927. This is, is so far looks to me to be very comparable with moonshine, very bright white color, uh, same around that volleyball size and a really nice traditional pumpkin look. RPX 6229. This is actually, uh, looks similar to the Machada types, but it's actually a people type with a regular traditional pumpkin. Uh, or classic pumpkin stem, but it has that nice tan color, very similar to your autumn buckskins. Spectre is a great, uh, uh, like a white, a cream white color, larger than some of those other whites I've mentioned. Really been a, uh, uh, it has a little bit of a hardened shell. Uh, the size again is larger and is a very durable, pretty good yielding uh, specialty pumpkin. Then the last two I want to mention are New Moon, which is a, a modest sized Maxima type white pumpkin. Um, I, this is one uh, probably falls more in the, I would say roughly 20 to maybe 40 or 50 pound range just offhand. Uh, so, but is, is a nice, I would say medium size of a, a jumbo sized pumpkin nice white color uh, and then we also compare that with polar bear so polar bear in this example i've seen i've seen examples easily twice this size but both of these are maxima types polar bear does get larger than what the uh, uh than what new moon does but certainly nice white pumpkins get a large size great uh great for being uh, kind of a, uh, a focal point of a display or something like that. So with that, I think we will, uh, I think we do have a final question coming in here.
so with uh, pesticide treatment, should um, should we have any concern with uh, as a consumer with purchasing or decorating with pumpkins? We have uh, some uh, we have some uh, strict guidelines as far as our um, uh, pre-harvest intervals and how we are uh, how we are handling our fruit. Uh, and when we're making applications, we don't make applications right up to harvest. You know, say a lot of things that we are very conscious of, especially if there's any level of toxicity, we are not applying that. Uh, and so we are, we are very conscious with all the research that's been done to make sure we are not harvesting something that has any kind of harmful level of any pesticide residue where we've used any of these products. And again, especially as a grower myself, we try to use as few of these products as possible and still be able to deliver a high quality, healthy crop for which you know most of the consumers are wanting and demanding. So I think that's our, our primary goal and we try to do it with the technology that we have as, as best we can to provide the quality that consumers want. So with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up for here. I wanna give everyone a uh, first thank you for attending our field day and being patient as we wade through all of the technology to try to provide this live in field and also answer some of your questions. Um, uh, with all this, we will follow up with an email. I know we've mentioned various resources. Uh, we have some previous reports and things that, I will, that we will be sharing links to within the next week or so, so you have more resources and also have the contact information for our presenters if you would like to contact them with further questions. So we really do appreciate all of you attending and certainly look forward to uh, interacting with you in the future and future programs. Thank you very much.